Welcome to the Digital Amateur Television Experimenters Night. This is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania. Amateur radio is a worldwide hobby that has many different aspects. Digital television is just one of the many modes and areas that are covered. Maybe you're interested in becoming involved in the DATV Experimenters Nights. Do you realise that you do not have to be a radio amateur or need any ATV equipment to participate anywhere in the world? Also participate in the night by coming up to the Queen's Domain Club Rooms. Yes, right on top of the Queen's Domain in the Heritage Listed Coast Wireless Station. You never know, we might get you in front of the camera or behind doing one of the many roles during the night. We get underway with our program on a Wednesday night from 7.30pm local time. We'll see you soon. This is VK7 OTC. Okay, this is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania with our DATV Experimenters Night, and I've got Rex, VK7 MO in the, sta in the station, in the studio. <laughs> studio. <Stadium. laughs> it's both of those, really. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Rex. Thank you, Justin. Now, just to um, our acknowledgement of country, uh, in recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, we'd like to acknowledge and pay our respects to all Tasmanian Aboriginal people, the traditional owners of the land upon which... We present tonight. Now, Rex is back in the studio after his fantastic presentation of a rural propagation last week. Was week it last before. week or the week before? No, it was the week before. We had caribou lights on yeah, last week. Right. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I, I do a quick, a very, very quick update. I, I reinstalled from scratch with a different operating system. <laughs> I'm no further progressed. <laughs> so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> so, Rex, now, uh, an update on um, a rural propagation. Where are we at? Okay, well, Justin sent me an email today saying, could I do an update on it? Because he, I must have naively given him the idea that... There things, was other things happening. That other things were happening. The reality is... We sort of work on the basis that you need at least five, a KP of five, and that that needs to occur during the evening okay. for it to be worthwhile. Yep. And we've had three events where we've been successful and it's been six or seven. Oh, okay. Um, so really good. The, yeah. the, this This is the value that the Aurora chases... A monitor, isn't it? That's yes. right. Okay. But I don't think there's a very close relationship between it and what actually happens. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, it's it, it's a sort of an indicator, but okay. Uh, Is that from a radio sense, or from a from a phot photographic sense, or from both? No, uh, I'm only really talking from a radio sense. Okay. But okay. Uh, since since I gave that talk, there's been three events where it's got up to five okay but not not in the middle of the evening okay and we got nothing at all okay uh so it may be that you really need six 
in the evening or seven. So, so when when you said it peaked, not in the evening. When when did it peak? Like, are we talking uh, afternoon or something uh, like that? Uh, early morning, uh, uh, you know, sort of eight o'clock in the morning. Ah, uh, okay, and that that would be that effect where the ring is in the other direction. That's right. Ah, uh, okay. Well, not completely at no, right no. angles. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, uh, when when Justin asked me if I could do an update, my initial reaction was, "There's really nothing to update." <laughs> but I did say, "Well, I'll update with what I think's going on." Okay. But even right. though we've not produced any more so, results. So, so you've tried. So the summary is you've tried over the last fortnight or so, but uh, uh, I mean we've only tried when when the KP index forecast was five. Right. Okay. And we've still not been successful. Right. Okay. But okay. we haven't had five at midnight. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's still possible five at midnight will work, but I think just we need a lot more data. Yeah. There's, I mean, okay. it, 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 it sounds splitting hairs between sort of five and six, but it's a log scale. So. I know. Well, the difference between five and six is, yeah, significant. Another order of magnitude. Correct. <laughs> you know? correct, 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 correct. So, uh, so, if we go to, we've got a little update here. Yes. Now, this picture, this, this was interesting. Uh, I'm trying. What's that dark line? Uh, I'm not ex exactly sure what the dark line is. It's the first time I've seen it, but um, that's interesting. What what this is is a picture looking at the sun, with the sun itself blocked out by yep. some device device shield or something. Okay. At a time when there was a a big coronal mass ejection going away from the earth so it's actually it's a bit hard to to, un, to see but if you imagine if it exploded from the back of the sun yes it, it will ultimately be visible yep. out of the, these yeah it, okay okay it, you know yep uh however this particular one they say was a one in ten year event it was oh and and this was okay about a week ago okay right uh and what they said is, despite the fact that it's not pointed towards the Earth, they predicted there would have been a, still a fair bit coming towards okay. the, the Earth, which would yep. get sort of caught up in the solar winds. Okay. This uh, is March 13th. It's, it's about 13th. a week ago. Okay. Uh, well, March 13th when it happened, and then it takes a couple of days to get here. Here. Uh, so, the forecast on, uh, and this is another another thing that we've learnt about KP indexes, okay. NOAA forecasts the KP index by averaging, the uh, KP index is really the micro variations in the magnetic field. Okay. And, and so if some... A lot of energy flies out, and, and it affects the Earth's magnetic field. Okay. And uh, so it's a measurement of that effect of, of the deviation of the magnetic field, okay. which, in a secondary way, is an indication that okay, there's been a significant amount of energy hitting the Earth. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, now NOAA forecasts this by averaging the data from thirteen stations around the world. Okay. Okay. And it's now become apparent to me that the NOAA forecasts differ quite a bit from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, which has a, a sub-organisation, which in my day was called the Ionospheric Prediction Service, which was separate to the Bureau of Meteorology, but has been absorbed into it. Oh, it's not called the IPS anymore. No, it's called Space Weather Services oh, okay. of the Bureau of Meteorology. S services. They need to put services in there. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, and they come up with... I mean, the trend is similar. Yeah. Okay. When, when okay. it's strong... It's going in the strong. right direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they come up with a different answer for the Australian region. Okay. So the first thing we've got to 
we've learned in this last week or so is you really need to focus on the KP index from, from the uh, IPS. Uh, yes. Yeah, from, from the space where the services, services yeah. yes. Okay. Okay. Part of the Bureau of Meteorology. Okay, okay. Uh, is, is it sort of consistently lower or is it... Uh, I don't think I've got enough data to answer no. okay. that question. Right. Okay. Uh, it, okay. was, it was for this event, <laughs> okay. lower. Okay. Uh, so when I was watching the NOAA one, I was getting all excited seeing uh, a six, a KP of six, but okay. the Australian one never got above five. Right. Okay. And we didn't get any signals. So, okay. uh, Sorry, back to as, as well as that, really talking about an explosion that wasn't even coming towards the Earth and what might sort of peel off and get caught in the solar winds and come in our direction might be quite misleading. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. If it was pointed in our direction, it might be a different matter. If it had been pointed in our direction, it probably would have been nine on the KP. Ooh, okay. And yeah. we would have been... Another Carrington event. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> Not quite. no, I think Carrington event is ten. Well, right. Carrington events are claimed to they think happen about once in every 150 years and this was a once in 10 year event okay okay right uh so not quite a carrington event but okay certainly would have been very interesting so for the sa sake of the the sun being round it sun rotates every 27 days yep. and for the sake of it being uh, 13 days too early or too late, <laughs> we didn't get the mo nice joy that I thought we might. Do. No, okay, okay, <laughs> all right, okay. So we'll go to the next slide. Nevertheless, uh, Andrew Klevercheck did see some aurora, and Andrew lives down in Kingston, or a little bit out of Kingston. Yep. And that little pinky glow there says that there was aurora at his place. Now, it's not surprising to me that uh, we didn't get radio aurora because Andrew's not set up for radio to, to transmit. Yep. Uh, he's promising to get a call sign. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is. He is. I, I can hold him to that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we, we need for the aurora to be visible right up at uh, southern Victoria yeah. because at this stage we haven't actually got any other stations S south south of here yeah okay uh, it'd be good to get some if anyone is listening who's interested yes. in what we're doing well we are I, I just had a bit of a look uh, hello to uh, Richard who is uh, at home uh, probably doing EME things because he's been... Uh, well, well, uh, to ask him if the beacon has come on. Yes. Oh, has the, okay, Richard, has the beacon come on? That's a, a question for Richard, so if you're paying attention, Richard. We've got Ron, uh, Ron Mann uh, watching RF and the stream, so he's got it in stereo, got it in a, in a, in a delayed stereo. And we've got, uh, welcome to David Bannister, who is actually, um, he's, he's come on to the uh, Discord channel, I know, uh, who's uh, new to ham radio, so... Uh, this is a little bit of what we get up to, David. So if you've got questions, please, please, please throw them into the uh, into the chat. And if if anybody has questions, please um, please throw them into the chat. And if you're watching, let us know uh, let us know where you're coming in from. So it's 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 good. So uh, we'll we'll go back and see whether Richards answered the question. So so there was optical aurora. There was optical. Now there's a couple of things that are worth discussing. You, you can see there's a lot of bright up to the north, that's mm. Hobart, yep. uh, off clouds and... Oh uh, yeah, mm, <laughs> up here. Uh, uh, <laughs> but the, the problem Andrew's got, he's got this all side camera and he, he, he measures just about anything you can think uh, of. All down here, pressure, temperature, radiation, um, etc, etc, etc. Yes. Uh, but his takeoff to the south is not that good. It's probably cuts off about five degrees. Now, five degrees would still be 
in rough terms, visible from southern Victoria if you had a perfect takeoff. Okay, okay. So okay. you start to say, well, we should have got something. Uh, uh, do, do, is there enough data... <laughs> I have to pretext my questions now. Uh, is there enough data to say if it's visible, you do get radio or not get radio, or is it? It's a good question because yeah, okay. that occurred to me too, and because that says to me that there was. Like, yes, so I I read up on uh, Radio Aurora and I found. Okay. Someone who said that, and it, it was a bit equivocal, they, they said most of the time Radio Aurora only works off the E layer, not the F layer. How did they come to that conclusion? Uh, well, they did some me radar measurements of the height that was okay. being reflected okay. from yeah, yeah. And, and so forth. Okay. Now, it turns out that the F-layer stuff is nitrogen that's ionised yes. and produces a red aurora. Yep. The E-layer is oxygen and produces a green. Okay. Now... Is that where the red and the green come from in an aurora? Yes. That's, yeah, okay. Now... And the sprites, actually, that's, they're, the, they're the red ones that are the nitrogen ones above, above the clouds... That, those sprites and um, um, blue jets that we were talking about. Right. Anyway, okay. So that sort of led me to think, well, well, it was a little bit equivocal. Mm. Uh, perhaps you really need an E layer and a green aurora, whereas, if anything, this was a pink one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definite, now, definite pink... Um, now, at the same time, I looked on the web and found a New Zealand site where they had a visible aurora. Excellent. Yes. And there is some green mm. lower down. Definitely. Uh, but clearly they had an excellent takeoff. This is from a lake just south of Christchurch, so okay. it's about the same latitude as, okay. as, yeah. uh, as Hobart. Yep. But their takeoff... Well, probably as close to zero. Uh, correct. Yes. And they could see the green stuff. So I think this is telling us... Mm. We need more data. Well, we're not, we certainly need more data to understand it, but it, it gives us a clue that we, we probably need to see green aurora before we're going to get radio aurora. <laughs> The interesting thing about that is the red's above the green. Yes. It should be the other way around, shouldn't it? No, the, the, the green is the E layer that's low. Oh, so it's the oxygen. The red the, is the, 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 the nitrogen. The, the, the F layer sort of I know. Yeah, okay. region. So that's the four, what, 400 kilometres? Kilometer, uh, and the others are the greens of 100 kilometres. Yeah, okay. Right. Uh, hmm, interesting. So, nice shot, though. Hmm. Well, not mine. Someone oh, <laughs> I stole it off the web, but yeah, okay. uh, I'm sure they don't mind. <laughs> no, well, it's 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 contributing to the um, research. Yes. So okay. Uh, so we'll now go to the next slide, and th this draws attention to the difference between the NOAA KP index and the Bureau of Met or what space weather services or oh, what used okay. to be the IPS. Yeah, 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 okay. So you can see at the bottom uh, is the... the, the this is the Australian. Australian, and that's covering the Australian... This is actual measurements after yeah. the event. Okay, okay. And they only got one that went to five, yep. whereas Noah, who averaged them from 13 stations all around the world... <laughs> Got three events in that. The, yeah. So Al although they, they're sort of a the yeah a link. <laughs> sort of correlate. Yes. So, what this tells us, you can't be too dogmatic about uh, KP. It's probably better to use the KP from Australia. Correct. 
when you when you're doing it. Uh, just let's go back to. Uh, okay, we've got Lionel uh, KJ seven O F H. So hello from New York State, um, and Richard no beacon, but he did hear O E five V R L, but no contact. He was horizontally polarized. OV was horizontal. Wow. Yeah. And Richard still heard him. Well, that was all right. Yeah, well, he heard him, didn't make the contact, though. Wow. So, um, and we've got Phil, uh, Phil Groom, uh, VK, uh, VK7ID. So, uh, there you go. Good stuff. Uh, he's down in Kingston. Then, oh, he? and Colin, and VK, VK5COL. Colin from South Australia, from down southeast. So, I think he's from southeast. Correct me if I'm wrong there, Colin. But uh, What's that? good stuff. Mount Gambier somewhere. Uh, yeah, I think so. Down yeah. uh, the Coonawarra somewhere. Mm. So uh, very nice. Okay. Okay. So I think the answer is we should take more notice of the Australian one. Uh, okay. But we're basing this all on very limited data. But uh, it's a data set that's being built yes, at the moment. That's being, right. Correct. So uh, I think we're going to need a lot more little short talks <laughs> Good. Cool. Cool, the, cool. What's happening? And, and is the um is the Australian data like easily accessible, as easily as the NOAA data? As... Uh well in fact the Australian um website puts both of them on. Oh in excellent. the same format. Too. Excellent. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh okay. The, the advantage of the NOAA website is it actually has a forecast as well. Right. Okay. Uh, so you really need... This is sort of after the event saying why it happened and it so didn't happen. This is what it actually measured? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So... Okay. You oh, well. ne need to look at both. Yep. Uh, now, that if we move forward, this is the latest sunspot image... And there's some nice big spots there. Oh, truly. And they will come across, essentially, when they're, when they're on the, the meridian, yep. uh, they will be pointing towards us. Okay. Uh, so for the... reasons that I don't understand, I would have thought you'd want them right in the middle. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Andrew Klevercheck tells me Providing they're within 45 degrees, which means they've got to be right in the middle at the top and the bottom. Yep. And, uh, but... So that one would be in the 45 degrees? Well, probably not quite yet. Not quite, yeah, okay. But but it's moving across. Yeah. They move that uh, yep. from, from left to right. Yep. So it's highly likely that one will be in range mm, mm, mm. in the next couple of days. And bear in mind, well, what we're looking at there is probably what, the size of the Earth? Uh, probably a lot bigger. Than yeah, the Earth. probably a bit, bit big, quite a bit bigger than the size of the Earth. So from a scale point of view, that's a bit scary. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so we then look at the NOAA forecast, because the, the Australia doesn't do next one. forecast, yes. Now, again, we can see the original NOAA measurements in green to yep. the left. Yep. Uh, that, and that's for about the last three days okay. where it hasn't got above four. Yeah, five's that line there. Yes, and it actually changes to yellow for five. Oh, okay, it, right. It, oh, yeah, yeah that's, that scale down here. Yes. Mm. Uh, so the last three days they're saying essentially wasn't going to work. Okay. And we didn't even try, so. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, but if you look to the right, their three-day forecast, you'll see on the 20... Th there's three days there. It's a bit hard to read them. Mm. But the 24th, you'll see it gets up to six. Oh, okay. The 24th is this column here, the, the, the last right. column. Yeah. And it gets up to six, yes, yes. at 2100 U U UTC. Now, the trouble is, 21 UTC is about 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, it's not quite at the time we want it. Okay. Uh, but it's up to 5 and something, or oh, a little bit before that. Uh, correct, yeah. Actually, the, the, the first two, so 15, 18 UTC, 
uh, is 5.33, and then there's 1821 UTC, um, which is 5.67. Yeah. And they actually name them up as G1, G2, and G2. Yes. So that, that's the K. Oh, that's the KP scale. Um, well, G1, G2, yes, G3, that, G3, yeah, G3. Yes. Noah three. prefers their own scale. scale. Okay. It would G, essentially, when it goes to, I think. It's uh, KP of 5, of equal to 5, is a G1. KP equal to 6 is a G2. KP equal to 7 is G3, etc. Yes. And and I think that it's a bit like bushfire scale. Oh, know? okay, yeah. you know? catastrophic. This is Carrington event. <laughs> yes, up here. that's right. Yeah, okay. So it's it's to try and give people the image of whether they should react to it or okay. not. You see. Well, um, power companies and satellite providers, etc., etc., etc. People et flying aircraft across the poles. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, because your your dose of, of energies, your dose of potential potentially harmful radiation yeah. uh, would be increased. Correct. And certainly astronauts on the moon. Are, uh, and in the International Space Station, because they yes. can't really go anywhere. No. <laughs> hmm. Okay. And, and I'm not sure you can put a lead shield around <laughs> anything in the space station, <laughs> economically anyway. Uh, correct, yes. So, anyway... Okay. This that's good. Uh, this suggests that uh, on the twenty fourth, two days from now, there's there may be an opportunity. There may be an opportunity. Yes, okay. it's. Uh, I mean, I would like six in the middle of the night, about uh, uh, eleven hundred UCC. But uh, okay. Ah, uh, oh, now okay, Richard. Richard has just let us know. Um, you heard him at minus twenty one. I assume that's OE5 VRL. Um, <laughs> and Colin, I apologise. I apologise, Colin, you're on York Peninsula, west of Adelaide. Yes, I know York Peninsula very well. My mum grew up on York Peninsula down at a little place called Inniston, which is a national park now. Um, <laughs> so there you go. Ah, okay. So, so yeah. So, okay. so Richard copied the OE at minus 21. Yes, I think that's what he's saying there. Which right. is a pretty good signal if they're cross polarised. Oh, correct. Uh, Got some header in there too. Yes. So, so great. Yeah. So uh, now the the other thing to, that's sort of come up in discussions is there's some evidence that good rural events occur at the equinox. Oh, which we've just had. About now. <laughs> Correct. Uh, it didn't happen this equinox, but we're, we're not that, still not that far from the equinox. Uh, Correct. Correct. And we've Correct. got these big sunspots moving across. Moving in the right direction. Yes. Okay. So maybe it will happen. Oh, and Rex, it's very sad, but the reason I know that it was the equinox was... Helen played harp at an equinox party. Really? Okay. Would you believe? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so there so, you go. So, you know, well, KP index itself is an indicator. You've also got to have it at the right time when the 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 uh, the rural oval is pulled towards us. Yep. Maybe you also need. An equinox, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think there's more luck in this than there is science. <laughs> and you need the Aus you, It's probably more accurate to take the Australian measurement. That's right. Than the than the NOAA one. Yeah. For yeah, Australia, yeah. now I don't know whether NOAA provide the actual data from the American sites separately. Hmm. Okay, that would be interesting. Uh, which would be useful for the Americans. Because I assume one, like one or more of those 13 stations would be Australian. like. Yeah, you'd reckon. Well, I'm sure... Uh, I'm pretty sure Learmonth hmm. would Exmouth. be... Exmouth, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Okay. I know a lot about Exmouth. Uh, mm -hmm. 
because I signed an agreement with the US Air Force to set up oh, the Solar Observatory. Okay. <laughs> cool. When I was cool. much younger than I am now. <laughs> so that, was that in bomb times, in Bureau, bureau no, times? No, no. I, I was actually the liaison officer in Canberra for the Ionosphere Prediction Service. <laughs> okay. Is this administrative services? Is this your administrative services days? No? Uh, no? Well... And, and I, I just say administrative role, but right. you okay. know, I mean, okay. not doing any science or engineering no, no. or anything, just making wheels happen, <laughs> mm -hmm. making sure it all all happens. Uh, cool. But, um, oh, very good. I mean, well, that's well, pretty cool. Yes. So I think Lemos, uh is probably one, but yeah. I don't know. I did try and look up, and I couldn't see where the thirteen was. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh well, fantastic. Oh, that's very good. Now, well, um, stick around, Rex, because the the next segment I think you can you can definitely add some add some stuff to. <laughs> so thank you very much, and I, I look forward to our next uh, Aurora update. Yeah. So and hopefully in in um, the, on the twenty fourth, so in a couple of days' time, you might have some more data. Hopefully. Mm. Okay, and uh, just a reminder: if you if you are an amateur that is down. Uh, south, uh, south of Hobart, um, then uh, please, 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 and you, you've got the ability to do two metres, um, two metres directional. Di digital. <laughs> digital. So, um, and, and a good takeoff to the south. <laughs> um, please get in contact with Rex uh, because he'd love to hear from you. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, uh, that's the story. Um, so, fantastic. Thank you, Rex. Now, um, a bit of uh, we move to a bit of history here. Um, I on the weekend I was collecting a uh, aluminium mask mast from um, uh, the the uh, I suppose you'd say the estate of Harvey Skeggs, who VK Seven Hotel Kilowatt. Um, and whilst I was up there, Meg was um, Me <laughs> Meg is trying to to downsize right at the moment. <laughs> And if, <laughs> and if, if anyone knows um, knows knows uh, Harvey and I, we've got Ron on 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 the the uh, RF and streaming. So <laughs> Ron's probably <laughs> Ron definitely knows what I'm talking about. Uh, is trying to downsize. So, um, but there were some very interesting things that Meg came up with, and one of them, and I I have to show you this. One of them was. This particular certificate. Now, this was issued to Pat Jeeves, VK7G Golf Victor. Now, Pat was Meg's uh, father. Yes. Meg was a Jeeves, uh, and Pat had a, uh, a fairly substantial, um, a fairly substantial station. Uh, <laughs> um, in fact, I ah. Oh, the one thing I was going to do was look to see whether Pat was actually on the honour roll, because I think he might be. Okay. Yeah. Um, he because he had a role in the Tasmanian division at some point, but anyway, um, Meg, uh, I, I talked to Meg and I said, "Oh, we are working on um, our centenary celebrations in June, twenty twenty three, because the." Uh, what we're calling organised amateur radio in Tasmania in VK7 started in June 1923. <laughs> um, it was actually uh, it was actually registered. The Tasmanian division of the WIA was registered in June 1923. So, um, so. This is uh, one of those those historical documents that uh, Meg donated to the club. It is the Amateur Radio Club. Um, now, I'll get this right. Hang on. Amateur Radio Club International, so A-R-C-I, QRP Award. And it's the 1,000 mile per watt award. And if you have a look here, it's got uh, his location. He contacted VE3FAO who's located at this location, this longitude and latitude, and it was calculated at 4.65 watts to, to travel 3,500 kilometres or 2,175 miles per watt of output power. 
on 20 meters, so 14 megs, um, and it was CW that he was using. So uh, back in um, August 15, 1991. So um, Meg, uh, a big thank you to Meg because uh, she um, she donated this as part of our uh, our history. Uh, because Pat was involved with uh, the, the Wireless Institute and uh, this was a certificate she came across when she was working through all of the bits and pieces that she, uh, she had, uh, had in the house. So uh, now the other thing, the other thing she passed on <laughs> was a fascinating book, absolutely fascinating book called <laughs> Ah, The Wonder of It All. Crystal Sets and Such by R.J. Young. And this is, uh, uh, this is a first edition, but it's, it's a book that was written for the commemoration of 70 years of broadcasting through the ABC radio station 774 kHz 3LO in Melbourne, 1924 to 1994. So this is an absolutely fascinating little book um, written by R.J. Young, which goes through uh, early recollections of receiving uh, 3LO. And when I mentioned this, um, Rex piped up and said, I remember re receiving 3LO on a crystal set. So tell us about that, Rex. Yeah, well, 3LO is the, the, uh, the Australian Broadcasting Commission station well in melbourne in fact there were there were two three that in those days there were three ar and three lo okay. um but uh when i first built a crystal set and i suspect i was about five uh I, I, the first station i heard was vk3 well, was three lo um now three lo was out on what was then just sort of farmland in the west of Melbourne, which would, if it's still there, is right in the middle of the suburbs. Um, it's been surrounded by suburbs, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it was the easiest station because it had much better antennas and m much more power. From the 1924 perspective. It, so, uh, yes. Uh, uh, I just keep no keep talking. I, I just wanted to show there, there's some wonderful photos of uh, of early kits. Yeah. <laughs> now, one one story that may be hypocritical, but my dad tells me, is that they did some measurements on the antenna pattern of three LO. Okay. And they found there was a null. Okay. And they were trying to track down this knoll, and the farmer had hooked up his fence and was generating electricity <laughs> from VK three L from so, three L A. So, so he was he was extending the pattern along the fence line, <laughs> or, <laughs> or whatever, or yes. absorbing <laughs> some of the pattern. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I love it. I love uh, it. <laughs> I remember my my mum loved three L O because it always had classical music and Oh well did she go to this sort of high tea party? Where uh, where, where they're all sitting around they're all they're all sitting around um having uh, having high tea with uh, uh, and listening to three L O three L O and and you can see they they they've even got the the amplifying speaker <laughs> Here on the crystal set. On the crystal set, so they don't, they didn't need. Although, hang on, this 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 lady here, or this this child, I think it might be, uh, here has some headphones on, but there there appears to be a uh, um, a speaker just here that they uh, they might be listening to uh, to uh, to. Uh, yeah. Well, my mem alone. memory is sort of after the war, and they had reasonable amplifiers and stuff. Is that the sort of antenna they had, or is that just a AM transmitting antenna? Oh, that, that's a transmitting antenna, surely. Yes, that, that's Top probably loaded. yes, that's probably three LO's actual transmitting antenna. Well, there you go, and it's from the um, courtesy of the AB, the Australian Broadcasting Commission. Can I just say commission? They're now a corporation. Um, uh, PMG Textbook Radio One. This is the transmitting antenna that's included in this book. 
<laughs> so, um, very impressive looking tower. Um, yeah, well, certainly I saw it at the time, uh, and I do remember it having a, a top hat loading, but... I'm just trying to work out whether they've got a height here. The foundations use 188 cubic yards of concrete and maximum thrust on the base is 156 tonnes. <laughs> um, I mean, it's amazing the trouble they went to, isn't it? Oh, well and truly. 2GR, radiator 650 foot high. So that's probably not necessarily three hellos antenna, but... No, 3VW, Dugan, West, Victoria. Well, Western Victoria. And... Um, six, six WA, WA in Wa Wagon West WA yeah. or two GR. That's six hundred. Oh no, it says ra yeah, radiator six hundred and fifty foot high. That's a pretty decent tower. Yeah, well, the radiators probably are coming out in the ground too by that amount. So that would have a pretty decent ground plane on it as well. I mean, so, hmm. think of didn't do it the, by halves. The, the cost of doing that. <laughs> well, ra radio was radio was radio. You know, they yeah. had to get the message out there. There, there was um, actually there was um, I I mentioned earlier. Um, we'll we'll go into shortly some more articles out of out of OTN, but there was a series of articles um, in an earlier OTN about Shepparton Radio Australia. Oh yes. And and the 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 antenna array in Shepparton is pretty impressive. That's that's um, arrays and all sorts of things and they can switch switch mind you that's more to get more to get signal towards Asia. That was that was better. Well it was short wave mm. and V beams and things like that. Mm. Uh, so and then, and then they had uh, a similar set up in Darwin. Okay. Until the cyclone hit. <laughs> Tracy in yes. 74. Yeah, okay. Doug 3 um was involved in running that station. Oh, okay, okay. And when the cyclone hit, they moved him south, and I don't think he ever went back. So. <laughs> I, I can understand that, because we, we had lots of Darwin refugees come to, to the congregation at Blackwood that we were in. <laughs> well, well they moved back to Adelaide somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they came to Adelaide because the, the Air Force shipped them all down to Adelaide. Yes. Um, well, and truly, I remember that. Um, and Oh, hang on, Colin. Uh, makes my tower sound real small and I only have five tonnes. <laughs> five tonnes of 40 MPA concrete holding one. <laughs> so... That's still a decent amount, Colin. So, um, well and truly. So, uh, good stuff. So, um, so a fascinating little book that we will actually put into the library here um, about three or low. So, thank you to uh, to Meg for uh, for passing that on. Uh, it does go into in the later chapters um, lots and lots of um, crystal set designs and improved, progressively improved designs, um, a smorgasbord of designs and ideas. Um, at the back, as well as a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of pictures of uh, of early early crystal sets um, that were uh, I assume being used to to uh, to receive three LO, um, as well as um, there's a whole lot of circuits in the back. Crystal detector characteristics curve generator. So this is very impressive. Um, um, and some anyway, great little book. So uh, thank you to Meg for passing that on. Um, so that's um. Uh, that well, how are we going for time? What we might do, I might hold over the rest of the uh, articles from OTN, um, uh, and just uh, this arrived in the mail today. Now, for those who don't know, this is the VKQRP Club's uh, magazine, Low Key, um, which is a, a great little magazine. comes out uh, uh, comes out every month I think every month um, 
Now, if, if you don't know, um, the VKQRP Club costs you the princely sum of $15 a year. And if you're into home brew, uh, if you're into low power operation, uh, there's a lot of fantastic things in here, uh, as well as uh, you get access to the website and they've got um, a whole lot of equipment supplies and all sorts of things. So to, uh, in this one, um, there is, uh, there now, what I, what I spied earlier, just before this, um, a reminder about the QRP hours contest on 80 metres. Uh, there's Andrew Davis, um, VK One DA, one of the Andrews. Um, <laughs> if you if you contact people in VK One, uh, if you call them Andrew, you've got a pretty good chance of getting it right because there's a lot of Andrews in VK One. Um, I know that from Sota. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, the the contest happens on the eighth of April, um, and there, there are two stages, two time periods and two mode um, in the contest. So from uh, 100, um, 1000, sorry, to 11 to 1059. So 1000 to 1059 UTC, it's the digital side. So it's our CW and FT4 digital. And then from 1100 to 1159, so the next hour, um, it's SSB and digital voice. So free DV. Um, in the uh, the contest, uh, you've got to limit it to five watts CW digital or ten watts PEP uh, single sideband. Um, it's eighty meters, so there is some suggested frequencies uh, for the different modes to match the band plan. Um, talks a bit all about uh, logging software, VKCL, N1MM, and a few others. So uh, QRP hours uh, contest, uh, eighty meter contest, eighth of April. Um, club's call sign now there's a little bit of a, um, a segment on using the club call sign and I know Peter Parker um, used the club call sign not that uh, not that long ago the club call sign is VK5 whiskey alpha tango so VK5 what <laughs> um, and uh, that, that you can book to uh, as a member of the QRP club book to actually use it uh, and then uh, then uh, send out the QRP clubs um, uh, QSL card now <laughs> It's very topical right at the moment. Um, lots and lots of articles, including I think Hayden's done, uh, Ham Radio DX uh, has done a video on this. Chat GPT, which is what everybody's talking about, AI, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, Chat GPT, if you put some questions into Chat GPT, uh, you can get some very interesting answers, quite scarily accurate answers. Um, and um, for those people who listened or tried to listen to the broadcast on the weekend, um, I used a um, what's called a synthetic voice, uh, which is an AI generated voice where it takes my voice from some recordings uh, and then uh, works out how I say particular things. And then uh, I give it a script and it reads the script in my voice. Uh, so that was the broadcast on Sunday and the repeat last night. We did slow the repeat down last night um, because there was a few comments that I was reading way, way too fast uh, and didn't take a breath for 30 minutes. <laughs> so, um, so we slowed it down a little bit, but it's still... Um, it's still pretty impressive technology. This is the this is the thing. I, I can um, I can train it with my voice and then give it a script and it will read it the way I read the script. So uh, it, it it knows about prefixes. It knows about suffix. It gets all of those right. So the megahertz and the kilohertz and the whatever else it gets right. There are some things it doesn't get right, and I'll just I'll just point out. Rocha Lee. It says a ro Rocha Lea. <laughs> Because it actually says it literally, um, but you can put into the script uh, the way you want it said, and guess what? It says it the way you want it said, and, and you can adjust the speed. Uh, well, I I, I I manually adjust the speed. Uh, I change the tempo of the um, the speech, but uh, you can 
you can do it somehow. I haven't worked out how to do it yet. The scary thing is with this particular application you can do, I'm using it for audio, but you can also use it for video. You can train it using video, so you can train it with your face, and you can then get your face to say anything. <laughs> Dear. Um, which is... Uh, if, if you if you um, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, one of the sites that I would I would get you to have a look at is um, people might remember there was a video put out by MIT. Actually, it was a bit of a research video that was put out that had Richard Nixon reading the speech that supposedly had been written if the astronauts crashed on the moon. Right. <laughs> so um, the White House had a speech for congratulations and they also had a commiseration speech. <laughs> and this particular video uh, was developed by MIT because they trained it because there is a huge amount of material of Richard Nixon uh, available yes. on, on film um, and a, a huge amount of, of audio of Richard Nixon. And they basically came up with this, I think, this fictitious script um, and got him to read it. And people, all the conspiracy theorists out there went, oh, that's a proof, that's, you know, proof that <laughs> they didn't go to the moon and all this sort of crap and whatever else. Um, but but um, that, that MIT have put that out along with a whole lot of things on how to recognise um, artificially generated video and audio on how to actually recognise um, that it is artificially generated. So it's it's quite a good website um, to look at. But Peter Parker, VK3YE, using chat GPT for QRP questions. So I absolutely love this. <laughs> good on you, Peter. So he's um, he has actually asked it a whole lot of questions, chat GPT, a whole lot of questions, and it's given some answers which are scarily accurate. Um, chat GPT just uh, one thing for those people who are using chat GPT it is own, you can't ask it things that have happened before I think it's 2021 or 2022 because it doesn't know so it, it's basic database is the whole of the internet oh, is, back to that day correct 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 so it gets it it, it um, it's interesting when it gets things wrong because it gets things wrong usually spectacularly wrong and you look at that and go, mm, that's not right. Feels like falsely codes. Oh, correct. <laughs> Spot on. Spot on. Um, yeah, you look at that grid square or you look at that course and you go, nah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, <laughs> the, the little, um, the little, uh, um, diagram <laughs> that Peter's included. CQ, CQ, meet space, as in M-E-A-T space. <laughs> Very good. Um, so um, so that's that's a good little article from uh, Peter Parker. And Peter Parker also is a regular contributor to this uh, magazine and, and writes a fantastic article, whether it's about antennas or it's about transmitters or receivers or whatever. Um, the QRP's guide, all band listening guide. Uh, so this is about where um, where a lot of the QRP's uh, sit for C on which frequencies on CW and SSB, uh, and the listener guide um, with from Steve Rawlins, who is G4ALG, and also he on the back page. This is actually quite good. Um, this is the all band listening guide. <laughs> um, Proposed all band listening guide uh, for all, uh, frequencies uh, 60, 10, all the way through to 40, uh, 40 to, well, 10 to 60 meters, uh, all the way through. Um, uh, look for QRP activity on your local QRP calling frequencies at the nominated times. So this is um, this is within the uh, within the hour. Uh, this is uh, to maximise your chance of contact, because of course. Um, QRPers um, uh, only have only have very low power, um, so you've got to have everything going for you to, uh, with the amount of noise and everything that is uh, in suburbia these days. Um, the other article, FT eight one eight modifications. Uh, there's a bit of a, an article on uh, the sort of the the common modifications that uh, uh, that uh, you can do to your FT one eight one eight and also eight one seven. Um, uh, 
uh, including um, uh, the iPhone iPad adapter for uh, your FT8, uh, the power pole adapter on the back, which is one of the mods that I've done to it. Uh, mine, mine also has um, uh, David's VK3HZ's um, GPS locking board in it as well. <laughs> um, so uh, I can GPS lock it for an IF rig. Uh, there's some member classifieds. There's Chris's VK1CT uh, crossword, his radio-related crossword, which is usually pretty good. Um, so, uh, and, the, and of course, the solutions to last month's. So uh, he does that each month. And, of course, the application for membership. Uh, it's still Australia $15, uh, and this is posted to you. Uh, so this is hard copy, hard, <laughs> hard copy. Um, uh, Low-key calendar. The net frequencies, membership guide, etc., etc. So, fantastic little magazine comes out. I think it's monthly, um, or it might be two monthly. Uh, Fifteen dollars a year, and um, has some uh, some fantastic uh, uh, fantastic resource in there if you're into QRP and uh, homebrew. So uh, that's that's the low key magazine. Now, just a reminder: uh, what's happening ahead? In two weeks' time, on the 5th of April, um, I'm giving a talk which is called the Mag Loop Myth Busting Presentation and Demonstration. So, um, uh, there is, for those who don't know, um, my... Actually, I'll show you, because <laughs> there's an interesting little nuance here. I took a photo tonight. I spent... The reason why I didn't operate in the John Moyle Memorial Field Day was I was rebuilding the Mag Loop. Um, for those who don't know, the mag loop um, came down with a crashing heap in uh, a couple of weeks ago when we had some scary gusty wind. Um, so I was actually rebuilding it. Um, this is this is the mag loop as it was uh, literally a couple of hours ago, and you will notice that there are some large concrete blocks uh, sitting on the base. <laughs> um, um, uh, because uh, it fell over and it smashed, it smashed the hundred mil PVC pipe right at the base. Now, fortunately, it didn't smash the vacuum capacitor that's up here. Um, I had to dent knock the loop a little bit, and I had to do some resoldering of the uh, copper uh, connections to the um, the the loop but uh, it's back in operation. It is currently um, currently on Whisper on 20 metres, um, and it is transmitting on Whisper. Um, I am getting about 50% uh, transmit and 50% receive, uh, over 10,000 um, uh, cycles, over 10,000 records. So that's telling me that it's receiving as well as it's transmitting. Oh, I see. Yes, that's that's what um, that's what that ratio. I I think that ratio is. Can I just say um, for those who don't know, um, if you go to the Whisper site, which is whisper dot net, um, whisper dot net, um, um, whisper net. Sorry, whispernet dot org. Get this right in a minute. Whispernet.org, which is where, if you are whispering, you're receiving or transmitting the the records that you receive, go to that website. So they're uploaded to that website. Um, if you go there, there is a wonderful thing that says Whisper.rocks. Now that is Phil Barnard VK7JJ's Whisper anal analysis site. Uh, very, it's worth a look. It is really worth a look because he, you can put in a whole lot of parameters and he does a whole lot of reporting. Um, now, we're talking about a month's, now, this is about 10 years ago, but about 10 years ago, a month's worth of Whisper data was well over, I think it was 10 or 15 million records in a month. Now, there are a whole lot more people on Whisper these days. So that would be probably a hundred million records. I don't know. It would be an order of magnitude, probably more than that. By records, do they mean individual Indi reports? Individual reports, yeah. well and truly, that are being uploaded. 
So we're talking about not insignificant data sets here. Um, and Phil's site, I don't know how he does it. Uh, probably be a good, um, probably be a good, um, good talk actually. If Phil, if you're uh, if you're watching, um, but um, uh, it is really quick. The analysis is really quick. The delivery of the reports are really quick. Uh, so really impressive site if you want to uh, analyze and I'm actually going to be using some analysis from that particular site in the presentation in a couple of weeks time so um, that's um, uh, the mag loop that's in two weeks time in um, for our April uh, our May sorry our May presentation uh, really interesting presentation by Theo Marine um, they have acoustically activated boys um, so they uh, very very impressive where you can send it some some a sequence of tones and the boy disappears to into the depths and then you go back with your GPS to the same location and put in the tones and the boy magically appears um, so pretty impressive uh, technology they're prepared to give us a bit of a chat on their technology uh, June is our uh, VK7 Centenary which I mentioned earlier and uh, in July we're getting uh, Tony VK7 XTC and Mike VK7 DMH to give us a talk on uh, satellite um, weather satellite uh, reception and uh, getting that all together they uh, have been posting some pretty impressive uh, pretty impressive um, uh, pictures uh, now oh hang on uh, Lionel the doomsday speech in the event of a failed lunar mission was real. Oh, there you go. Written by William Sapphire, and thankfully it was never given. Uh, definitely, thankfully it was never given. So th thank you, Lionel. No, it was real. It was real. Um, did they, did, uh, question for you, Lionel. Did they ever record it? Did they ever record Richard Nixon saying it and it's hidden away in uh, the, the White House's archives somewhere? Hmm. On uh, tape. On, on tape. Yeah, so Richard Nixon. That, that may, may, or may, <laughs> may or may not have been shredded. Yes. <laughs> during so that but that particular event. Um, um, not, to not, to, not to the best of my knowledge. Okay. <laughs> but hey, you never know. You know, you, we might find it in some uh, um, attic or some, some cellar somewhere. So, uh, good. And um, Sean, hello, Sean, uh, back um, back watching. Uh, Dynabolts are your friend. Yes, they are. If I Dynabolted it to the, uh, to the, to the concrete, I, I suspect I would be having to uh, answer to a higher power. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. All right. That's our program for tonight. Um, thanks for watching, and I hope, you, uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if so, please, please pass it on. Please like it. Please uh, pass it on to others so we uh, we get uh, we get people on uh, on board. So uh, we'll uh, bid you farewell and um, uh, have a good rest of the week. And we'll catch you next Wednesday. Uh, and then the Wednesday after that is our uh, our Maglu presentation. So this is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania, with our DATV experimenters night. And it's good night for me. And good night from Rex. <laughs> Cheers. 73.